Right, we're just going to kick off with a very short kind of group work exercise. How about that, Mr. Ruglo? So what I'm going to ask you to do for me, very quickly, is we've got five figures here. I want you to put them in order of wealth. Who are the, the wealthiest in the, with the equivalent of today's, today's money? So the wealthiest to the, to, to the least wealthy, as it were. Okay, so uh, number five. Anyone put the, the who, number five? Any suggestions? Bill yeah. Gates, Stalin. Number five, Stalin. Was not Stalin. Number five, Bill Gates. The wealth of about 80, 80 billion. Number four. Any ideas? Yeah. Stalin. Not Stalin. You all keep putting Stalin. <laughs> Number four is Andrew Carnegie, who was a steel magnate. Had a fortune of about 329 trillion or something. Right. Number three. <laughs> number three is the Stalin. Okay, number three, so you have the wealth of the USSR at his disposal. Number two? Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar. Excellent. And number one was a man named Mansa Musa, who was the king of Timbuktu, an ancient Malian kingdom. He had so much wealth, apparently, that when he was on a pilgrimage to Mecca, he caused an inflation crisis in Egypt, which took the country 10 years to recover from. OK. Two pictures on the board. Who are they? Mr. Bossig? I have no idea. That's you have at all. <coughs> on the left, we have William Wilberforce. <coughs> on the right, we have Toussaint Louverture, who we will see later, who is the leader of slave revolts in Haiti. Okay, can I ask you a very quick question? Who discovered America? Fire it at me. Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus, thank you. Thank you, you haven't disappointed me, good. <laughs> right, okay, so the point of the uh, talk today is to open your minds to new possibilities and different ways in which we can see the world and the story of humanity. Now, it's very strange that our immediate reaction when we ask very kind of simple questions, who discovered America, who abolished slavery, is to immediately turn to white Europeans for our answer. Who had Mansa Musa, the king of Timbuktu, as the wealthiest? You know, you knew the answer beforehand, though. So, what I'm going to do today is talk to you about the role of Africa in the human story and the African diaspora. Does anyone know what diaspora means? Anyone, Mr. Ogle? Spread. Spread. The spread of Mr. Bosley? Yeah, so, I was going to say that. Very similar. Okay. So we're going to kick off with a. a sorry, I, I did intend for this to be in front of me, but being vertically challenged, I thought it's bit too big. Um, so, right, I asked you the question, who discovered America? You all said Christopher Columbus. There was a man in the 1960s that wrote a book called They Came Before Columbus. He's a man called Ivan Van Sertima, who was a scholar from the West Indies, and he suggested that actually it wasn't Christopher Columbus that discovered America. There was an African presence in America long before Christopher Columbus arrived. And he cited several pieces of evidence which suggested this. In the first instance, he said there were ancient Nubian ships, these are ships that were built in, in West Africa, that were found in America. He also cited a skeleton which was of a Negroid origin in 12, uh, dating back to 1250. The Smithsonian Institute found this. There were another two things that he cited, another two pieces of evidence, which he said show that there was an interaction of culture between uh, the Americas and West Africa. Right, have a look at these. Where do you think they're from? Yeah? Looks like Mayor, okay, thank you. Any other suggestions? Mr. Timpson? Okay, 
So the pyramid on the left dates from around 2500 BC, is indeed a Mesoamerican pyramid. The pyramid on the right is an ancient Egyptian pyramid dating back from 4000 BC. Mathematicians have uh, studied in depth the relationship between these two pyramids and they concluded, a very famous mathematician, concluded that the relationship was such that quite simply they had to have been related in one way or another. Okay, so what I would like to posit to you, the thought that I would like to give you is, why do we see history in this way? Why do we not uh, explore possibilities that there was indeed an interaction of culture between Africa and the rest of the world? Part of the reason, I would suggest, is that the writing of African history is fairly new. It's it really only kind of dates back to the period of colonisation in the 19th century. And some of the views of Africa, when the first European explorers went to, to Africa in the 19th century, some of the views of uh, Africans and African culture were very primitive, they were very backward. People couldn't write, and therefore they didn't have their own culture. So here are a couple of quotes. The first one from H.M. Stanley, who was an explorer in southern and central Africa. For countless centuries, while all the pageant of history swept by, Africa remained unmoved in primitive savagery. The second quote, 30 years later, from H.H. Johnson, another explorer of Africa. White people have been the unconscious agents of the power behind nature in punishing the Negro for his lazy backwardness. The races that will not work persistently and doggedly are trampled on and in time displaced by those who do. It's a highly racist concept, which I think carried through the writing of history until fairly recently. And subsequently, uh, the way in which we view the world is through the prism of, of uh, white European history, ostensibly. Now, no credit is given to Africans, or the African diaspora, anywhere in, in history, I would suggest. And there's been a classic example, something that we all study during our time in school, in which we don't really acknowledge the contributions of uh, African diaspora. Okay, that is the story of slavery the abolition movement, the abolishment of <coughs> slavery. Slavery was abolished by the British in 1807. And traditionally, our answer when we asked, if I was to ask you the question, who abolished slavery would be William Wilberforce. Now, I don't want to diminish William Wilberforce's contribution to that abolition movement, but what I do want to do is open your minds to the possibility that his actions followed on from the actions of other people. Now, Slaves themselves engaged in a long, protracted struggle in Haiti between 1794 and 1804. The slaves themselves, the enslaved people, overthrew the government and became the government themselves. Quite simply, a remarkable achievement. The slave revolts were led by these two men, a man called Toussaint Louverture, a self-educated uh, son of a uh, West African slave, and Jean-Jacques Dessalat. Now, these two men served for a period of time in the Spanish colonial army, and when they returned from their, their ventures, they decided that they had had enough, and they mobilised slaves in Haiti and overthrew the government. This is a remarkable achievement. It was remarkable because it broke the back of the transatlantic slave trade. In fact, it even precipitated the Louisiana Purchase. Now, Louisiana, in America, was owned by the French. Napoleon had this idea of recreating uh, the sugar plantations in Louisiana. Very, very profitable, 
However, after the slave revolts, Napoleon decided that it wasn't, it wasn't worth it anymore, and so sold the state. The abolition of slavery was a remarkable achievement, and it was a remarkable achievement because the revolt itself was very modern in its outlook. What could be more democratic than slaves themselves overthrowing their overlords and becoming the government themselves? It was also modern for another reason. 30% of the fighters in the slave revolt were women. On the left, a lady called Cecile Fatima. She was responsible for bringing together the leaders of the slave revolts and organising actions and, and uh, areas of fighting. On the right is a lady called Santi Belair. It's a really interesting story about Santi Belair. Um, she was captured and she was sentenced to death. At the time, women were hanged and Men, if you were captured and you were going to be executed, you would be executed by firing squad. She requested to be executed by firing squad. And on the day of her execution, her husband, understandably very, very upset, uh, began to weep. And she told him, stand up. Do you know what it's like to die for liberty? How sweet it is to die for liberty. Stand up. And he we have two women that perhaps you hadn't encountered until today. And this, I hope, will give you an insight into the progressive nature, really, of the slave revolts and their actions took tremendous courage, and on the whole, they were very, very successful. Now, why is it that we give credit to abolitionists, but we won't acknowledge the contribution made by slaves themselves? I think much has to do, as I suggested, with the writing of history. Much has to do with the fact that black people, black Africans in particular, were not, or haven't been regarded by historians for many, many years, until fairly recently, as having the capacity or capability to achieve such prominent things. Now, who's this man here? Yeah. It is Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah, absolutely. We all know Martin Luther King's contribution in organising uh, the civil rights movement and achieving liberation for uh, people in, in America. Uh, who's this man? Any suggestions at all? This man is called Marcus Garvey. He organised. He organised six million people without Facebook, without Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram. He organised six million people. He uh, wrote very prominently in the 1920s about African equality and that black Africans are equal in the eyes of God and therefore should not in any way, shape or form be subjected to domination by uh, colonial powers by this time. Uh, large parts of Africa have been colonised by uh, European powers. He had a, uh, a, a, an organisation called the United Negro Improvement Association, which wrote pamphlets which were disseminated to Africa via uh, soldiers in, in World War I. Um, and in these pamphlets, he wrote some of his teachings about why Africans should not tolerate colonialism. Now, his works heavily influenced this man, a man named Kwame Nkrumah, who was the first leader of an independent Ghana. Before independence, it was called the Gold Coast. Now, that's the you know, Gold Coast, Ghana, in West Africa. Now, Kwame Nkrumah, a very, very interesting uh, it's a subject very close to my heart. Um, he studied in America, he studied in Britain, he studied the teachings of Marcus Garvey, and he returns to Ghana, um, having spent some time in Britain in 1947. When he arrives in Ghana, he is faced with uh, 
a situation in which people are not particularly happy. Ghana had made a huge contribution to the war effort of Great Britain. It contributed uh, 74,000 men, 74,000 men had volunteered. It had contributed uh, half a million pounds in, in loans to the British government. And there was also something quite interesting called the Spitfire Fund, where people went around with a, with a bucket to the local villages to collect change and money, which was used to buy a Spitfire for the British forces. Again, you know, it's people felt passionately about wanting to contribute in a meaningful way to the British war effort. After the war, however, Kwame Nkrumah returns to his country of birth, and he's quite shocked at what he sees. He sees a lot of soldiers coming back from war and they don't have jobs. He sees uh, huge inflation and people are going hungry, and he sees a lot of angry people. The least he felt that the people could be given was the vote, an opportunity to have a say in the government of their own country. Alas, this wasn't to happen. Those racist views that we saw at the very beginning still permeated through certain sections of the British government. The British government didn't feel, or certain members of the British government, I should say, didn't feel as though uh, the African indigenous people of the Gold Coast were yet ready for their independence. And they anticipated a time of between 50 and 100 years before these nations would gain independence. Now, Kwame Nkrumah was not very happy about this. And so he started a campaign to organise people. <coughs> he organised boycotts of European shops. He tried to bring the British administration to its knees in order to suggest that, look, you can't simply uh, exclude us from the government of our own country. And he was very successful in doing so. He was so successful, in fact, he was put in prison in 1950. The British government decided that he was... Uh, a radical, and they used to be put in prison. How disappointed some people were when Nkrumah wins an election from his prison cell in 1951. And they are forced, the British colonial administration are forced to release Kwame Nkrumah despite their attempts to fix an election in favour of a rival party who they saw as being perhaps a little more moderate. <coughs> For a period of six years, Kwame Nkrumah entered into a period of rule with the British, and he developed industry. He gave people jobs, he gave people hope that they too would be able to have the vote. And in 1957, because he had proved himself so adept at governing his own country. He was uh, given, or his party, the Convention People's Party, were given independence. And it's a remarkable story. Again, it, he didn't stand still. Kwame Nkrumah wasn't somebody that stood still. Within a period of seven years, he had helped to organize leaders of African nationalist parties across the continent. And by 1964, most of these countries became independent. He made a huge contribution to not only Africa, but also Britain's place in the world. <coughs> in fact, this is something that we will be looking at in much greater detail over the course of the next three or four months. Because owing to the actions of this man, he caused some members of the British government to suggest that actually Britain's power doesn't come from having lots of colonies, but it ought to come from Europe. Unsurprisingly, not long after Ghana became independent, the British Prime Minister made an application to join what is now the European Union. So this has a lot of contemporary relevance for us. But once again, it's not something that we acknowledge in the human story. Now, the fact that the views of uh, 
Africa and African people not necessarily being acknowledged or afforded their place in, in human history. He's seen even in contem contemporary scholarship. Um, I'm sure some of you have come across Neil Ferguson's book, Empire. Um, uh, Neil Ferguson is a wonderful historian, um, very controversial. He grew up in uh, Kenya at the time of a very famous rebellion, the Mau Mau Rebellion. Um, I would encourage you to, to, to read it and, and, and read up on the Mau Mau Rebellion because it's extremely interesting. Um, the British had engaged in a, in a guerrilla fight, a guerrilla warfare with Mau Mau rebels and had afforded out to them the most brutal treatment, concentration camps, torture, but yet this story isn't acknowledged by Neil Ferguson, who comments that the British Empire, which I would suggest to you in many respects, was built on uh, suppression, was a very progressive force. Now, I'm not here to, to necessarily dispute the scholarship of Neil Ferguson, but I would say that if we are to acknowledge the British Empire as a progressive force, we must also acknowledge the premise on which it was built. Only very recently have victims of the Mau Mau Rebellion achieved for themselves a, uh, an apology from the British government. I think this photograph is from 2011. They are also in receipt of um, uh, compensation. I believe. So, what I would like to present to you is this. In a whistle-stop tour, shall we say, across the ages, I hope that I've introduced to you a few ideas or a few themes pertaining to the role of Africa in our human story. We, if we are good historians, if we, uh, we have to understand where we are today by understanding where we have come from. And that's something that I don't yet think we have done or have achieved with regards to the role of Africa in the human story. In a world in which we champion values of democracy and humanity, we have to, we have to understand Africa's place. In it. And it's not my place here to uh, uh, reappraise the teaching of history. But what I will say is that it's something that we at least need to consider. Why do we spend, for instance, so much time looking at how many wives Henry VIII had killed when we don't look at the Haitian Revolution in any meaningful context? I think we have to do that. So, thank you very much for listening. I hope I have at the very least been able to introduce you to some things that you will take away and, and think about and perhaps read up on a little more. But Africa does have a place. It does have a place and it did in many respects pave a path for the society in which we live today. Thank you. It's a controversial one. Um, I, I think, from my perspective, we histories have, or, or the history of peoples or regimes, have lots to, in our perspective, apologise for in many respects. If we were sort of apologising for the mistakes of history, then perhaps we would be doing so for a for a very long time. I, I am somebody that wouldn't necessarily uh, say that that's the, the right thing to do, but I would say my claim, certainly, and what I'm very passionate about, is 
at least trying to encourage an understanding of the basis on which British rule or Britain's greatness has been built. It's as simple as that. You know, we have to understand it. We have to understand the uh, nature of uh, suppression of rebellions, for instance, in India or in different parts of Africa. So if there has been forms of, of progress, as say Neil Ferguson would suggest, what has been the human cost of that? Particularly since Britain is, is now or, or uh, engaging in, in conflicts around the world um, on, on the basis of uh, the, the lack of civil rights afforded to people by particular governments or I hope that sort of answers a sort of political bit. Yes? I was wondering on the back of that, <coughs> um, roads should fall debate that came up a few um, months ago. Um, what do you think of the idea that modern society in some form wants to rewrite um, white colonialists' um, mm. participation in Africa? Rather interestingly, Neil Ferguson's book was actually an attempt uh, against this uh, attempt to rewrite history. He had felt that actually we'd, we'd gone too far in trying to kind of see a, 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 a liberal approach to history or see colonialism as being a, an intrinsically bad thing. So he came out and said, well, no, we shouldn't be doing that. We shouldn't be trying to, to, um, to go too far the other way. I do think there is a propensity to try and rewrite things depending on the context in which we find ourselves as a, as a society. Um, on a personal note, again, I don't know if, if this is necessarily the, the, uh, the, the traditionally held view, but I don't think we should be rewriting history. I don't think we should be rewriting history. We should be approaching history from a very broad perspective and trying to understand the constituent parts of each of the stories that we study. Um, it's, yeah, the, the Rose Must Fall is, is an interesting one. Um, I've heard some very convincing arguments from both cases as to why they believe it should be, um, it should be brought down. Um, rather interestingly, Cecil Rhodes, as some of our A-level students will uh, sure attest to, played a very, very important role in the formulation of Britain's African policy. Um, and we can't overlook some of his more positive contributions to the history of Who should I choose? Who should I choose? Right, go for it. Uh, you've talked about like British colonialism. Yeah. Um, why? Why haven't we talked about like French colonialism? Or is it because the British were more dominant? Really good question. Really good question. Um, I could talk for ages on this, but I think the the, sim the simple answer is I think the way in which Britain ruled its colonies differed very much from the French. So the French empires, for instance, uh, wanted to, at the point of decolonization and, and sort of granting independence to African countries, and we use Africa for an example because the French and the British empires expanded beyond the confines of, of Africa. The French wanted to assimilate all of those African countries into what they sort of being a greater France. So there isn't this sense of separateness between them. Whereas I think in the British instance, there, there is. There is politically, there is economically, there is in terms of, of, of language and culture, which I think doesn't necessarily exist. And also, again, uh, the amount of scholarship that has been written on the British Empire is, is far greater than uh, the scholarship from the French Empire. Um, there is a story about the British Empire which is quite interesting, uh, or some people find a little bit more interesting than, say, the French, which experienced a very peaceful transition to independence, perhaps with the exception of Algeria. But I hope that sort of answers your question. Another simple way to, to simplify it, the British Empire is my, my thing, really. So, you know. Uh, yes? I think now with all social media and sort of television it's easier to start a rebellion because we start something 
And it was wins, so organising all the people. Yes, I do, definitely. Absolutely. And I think we, we are seeing that the rise of but yeah, I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing because it opens debate to, to uh, lots of different possibilities and new ideas about the way in which we govern we govern ourselves. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Just to be controversial. I love history, but can you learn more from the study of novels than you can from the study of historical writing? Um about this subject. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of saying. Um, I do, no, I do agree. I do agree. I think it's, it's quite interesting because I think so. Rather strangely, people feel as though they have, on a very basic level, people feel they have more freedom within the confines of, say, a novel than they do within a historical text. Because in a, in a novel, you can reveal feelings and, and your more personal experiences, which sometimes people don't have or don't feel that they can do within historical text. If that kind of makes sense, you know. Um, I'm a great fan of a, of a poet, a, a Malawian poet called Jack Mapanji, who was imprisoned by Hastings Banda in the, the 1970s, I'm not sure. But if you read his poetry, it gives a far better insight into the nature of uh, government and, and treatment of people in Malawi than a, a historical text. Of course, because historical texts at the time were, were heavily censored. So they couldn't possibly reveal what it was like to live under particular regimes at that.